CES 2017 is in full effect, and while most of it is stuff we can't hope to afford currently, it kind of gives us a look into the future as to where technology is going and what we can maybe afford when the price comes down and it becomes more mainstream. So what I'm going to do is we'll go through CES as stuff happens. It may, it'll probably go through the weekend, honestly. I'll probably have to make a couple of these because stuff will get announced pretty frequently throughout the weekend. So what we're going to do is I'll show you a bunch of cool stuff, talk to you about why it means something, and then hopefully you guys learn something or you see something cool you can look forward to in the future. So the first thing that's kind of interesting is there is now a way to do wireless charging without actually having to touch anything. Because before you do wireless charging was really just you having to take your phone, put it on a pad so it would still have to make contact to charge. Well, at CES they're showcasing a technology that's going to allow us to eventually not now, definitely not now, but eventually charge through the air and provide power through the air. So there's a startup called Energis, and their plan has been to send basically power signals through RF, which is like radio frequency, and that's going to allow us to do things like charge your mouse, charge your phone, charge your headsets, charge your Fitbit. Uh, basically anything you have that takes a battery can then charge wirelessly. Their eventual goal is to be able to provide actual like wall power without any cords. So you can just charge it wirelessly or you can provide power to something that needs it so we would not be at the constraints of like a battery anymore. Now currently it's very, very early stages. They can only charge from a couple inches away through those RF signals, but that does give hope that eventually we can get to a point where we don't need cables to charge our stuff. You also need a little sticker. It's called a Chipolo sticker and you stick that to your device and it will then charge from the source. Keep an eye because keep an eye on this because it's definitely something that will actually matter in the future as opposed to some of the tech you see here which is kind of just fancy and fun to look at this is something that i could see actually having a real world benefit and speaking of stuff that's fancy and probably is unneeded check out what razor came to the show with they came to the show with a laptop that can function with two extra screens so it has three screens in total and it's kind of attached to it through a platform now they're calling it project valerie and what this is going to do is allow those three screens to work in tandem so you can it's almost like if you're at home and you have all three are plugged into one video card and you can do things like like ultra widescreen gaming and each screen is 4k resolution it means it's a resolution of 11,520 pixels by 2160 pixels that's ridiculous that's that's way probably too much for what you need i mean it's a laptop so it's portable i can't imagine someone would roll into starbucks with this thing plop it down on a table and start working unless they're like a jerk, <laughs> but it, I mean, someone would probably do it. I can't imagine. It's probably super expensive too. I've, I have no idea how expensive this thing is. That's the one thing you'll see at CES. They don't tell you how much stuff costs. Usually they just like to show it to you. And then, you know, down the road as the technology gets more accessible, then a price comes out. So a lot of the stuff you're going to see guys probably doesn't even have a price right now. It's also worth noting that the laptop, even with the three screens, still only one and a half inches thick when it's folded up and it still weighs around 12 pounds. Like I think it's like 11 and like 11 point like eight pounds. So it's still really light and pretty thin for having three screens attached to it. And while we're on the topic of screens, let's just get right into TVs because the TVs are what really takes the show over because it's the most consumer product you have there since we all have TVs we're all always to, looking to eventually upgrade our TVs so these companies show up with everything they have in terms of LCDs LEDs OLEDs plasma it doesn't matter they're gonna show up and they're gonna show it off to hopefully get people's attention with their new technology and I have to say some of the technology at the show so far for screens have been really cool because for example, LG shows up with a display that doesn't actually need speakers. So what happened was LG shows up, plops their TV down in their in their booth, and it ends up being a 65-inch OLED Ultra HD screen, and the speakers are actually built into the actual screen itself. And you're probably wondering, how, how does that work exactly? Because you usually need speakers to create sound. Well, this is where OLED, OLED becomes really interesting because it's so thin it can actually act as the membrane for the audio so when vibrations come through to make sound the screen will actually act as that membrane to then bounce signals into the room and sony had the same idea uh so lg is calling theirs crystal sound sony is calling theirs acoustic surface and sony's is also a an OLED TV it's a Bravia one of their Bravia lines but it's an OLED TV as well and again you don't need speakers so what they're saying is you will get a better audio experience because the sound is coming directly from the image that you are looking at it's not going to be coming from like a speaker next to it it's going to be coming from the actual screen the one complaint that a lot of the people on the showroom floor so far has is that the sound is a little weak Sony 
and LG are saying that they are working on it currently to make the sound, I guess, louder, maybe deeper, you know, the bass better. There's a lot of stuff they still need to work on. This is just a prototype. I, no one even thought this was possible a year ago, so I'll give, them a, I'll give them a little bit of time because this could actually be great because tough to put a speaker into a very thin TV because that speaker is always going to add thickness. Same with ports. HDMI ports, believe it or not, are starting to become the bottleneck for making a TV thin. And speaking of thin TVs, you're not going to believe this one. So once again, LG shows up with their new prototype LLED signature TV, and it's going to be a whole lineup. It's going to be for anywhere from 55 to 77 inches in terms of from diagonal to diagonal. And these TVs are three millimeters thick. No, you did not mishear me. They are literally the size of like that. They're so small that the idea is to be able to put them up against the wall and eliminate any gap around it so that it's as close to being flush to the wall as possible. And they're actually talking about it possibly being like a wallpaper type thinness down the road. Right now though, it would actually be so close to that that you would have a hard time actually seeing a difference between the TV and the wall in terms of where it ends and where it begins. However, they said you actually need to mount it to the wall because that it's so thin, it's very wobbly obviously, it needs that support of the wall. So you're literally like, we're gonna start just hanging wallpaper and that's our TV in the future. And you actually even need a certain type of mounting, it's actually you, what you do is you hang it up with just magnetic brackets because the TV, I assume, I haven't obviously picked one up, is so light that it's actually not going to fall off the wall easily. Now I would be kind of concerned with their new sound technology if they do try to run it through this because that's going to create vibrations. I'd be interested to see if the TV, I don't know how, how serious those vibrations are, I assume you can't notice them, but I'd be curious if the TV would start to move over time just because of the vibrations or even slowly start to fall off the wall just from vibrations, but I would, I would assume it might move left or right, maybe you'd have to reset it every year or something, but I don't know. I don't even know if they'd build it into something that small. I mean, three millimeters, it has to be very fragile. And to go along with TVs, we do have a new HDMI compliance. We have HDMI 2.1 now, which will allow for that super large, probably unnecessary at this point, 8K image, but it should also give even more bandwidth if you have a 4K TV and maybe you're doing like 3D or something else, I, I don't know, HDR, 120, 144 hertz, anything like that. This is just a new upgraded HDMI cable with just more bandwidth, mostly for 8K, that's what they were throwing around, 8K HDR and gaming, that's the big stuff they were throwing out there for people to get this HDMI cable for. So we'll keep an eye to see if it actually shows up in stores anytime soon. I assume it'll probably be, probably in the next couple months it'll start showing up. And NVIDIA is jumping in on the cloud-based computing part of the market now. I know Microsoft's been talking about doing this for a while for physics. Of course, we had On Live that was purchased by Sony for PSN Now. And here we go with NVIDIA. Now, you could kind of do this before where you could basically stream PC games for like $8 a month for a game. And you would use their computers, essentially, in like a server farm somewhere. In this case, though, you can buy the game, and then you could spend money to get hours on these ultra-strong computers. Now, they've done things to try to cut down on latency, but you're still going to get it if you go through the internet, because it has to send a... When you hit... When you press forward, for example, you press W to go forward, it has to take that keystroke, send it to the server, send it back that you're doing that, and it's basically back and forth there where your upload speed matters actually a great deal. So you have to be careful with that because you may get a bad experience with something like a fighting game. Like if you try to do Street Fighter, it's probably not going to be very fun. But if you're playing something like an RPG or maybe you're playing like a, like a standard shooting game, it's not going to be as bad. So keep that in mind. But you also have to keep in mind the price. It's going to be $25 for 20 hours. So it's going to be a little over a dollar per hour. So you have to figure out if that's worth it or not for you to spend that kind of money where over time you could probably save that money and just buy yourself a decent video card and then not have to even, you know, mess with their servers at all. Keep in mind your bandwidth caps could be hit pretty quickly with this as well, considering it. there were studies shown before with OnLive that would show you would chew through your data cap very quickly depending on which games you were playing. However, of course, the benefit is that if you have a, a bad computer that cannot play games usually, you at least have access in some way to be able to play these games that maybe you, you wouldn't be able to otherwise. 20 hours is about, uh, usually longer than what the, the standard AAA game that comes out is. So for $25, you can use their servers to then play this game. Of course, you will have to have also already bought the game, 
but you would have had to do that anyway. So this way you can buy the game and then you can essentially rent out servers or like a computer to then play through the game and be done with it. I think I prefer the method of buying hours as you need them as opposed to having to sign up for a subscription service. It probably benefits them as well because then they know how much uh, time has been purchased in a month and they can kind of scale up or scale down as they need to. And that's going to be it for today, guys. I think tomorrow we'll do another one of these, maybe Saturday and Sunday as well. As CES goes on, there's just so much stuff to cover. It's insane. There's self-driving cars. There's the personal assistants. There's cameras. There's cell phones. There's just so much stuff going on. I'll break them up into small chunks so you guys can kind of get an idea and you don't have to sit through me talking to you for three hours probably based on how much stuff is here. But definitely comment, like, subscribe if you want to follow along with the series for CES. I think we'll have some fun and probably find out about some cool technology. Also, check out tomorrow morning for Newswave, guys. I will see you next time.